Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome. Thank you for attending this session this afternoon. I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Antoinette van der Merwe, who will do the official welcome and uh, will introduce our speaker for today as well. Thank you, Antoinette. Right, thank you so much, Karen and colleagues. It's absolutely wonderful to see so many people online for this third Learning and Teaching Enhancement Seminar of uh, 2022. So without any further ado, I would love to introduce Prof uh, Fadil Esop to you. He's currently a professor in the Division of Medical Physiology in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University. He's also the director and co-founder of the Center for Cardiometabolic Research in Africa, CARMA, at Stellenbosch University. He's a Fulbright Fellow, an NRF B rated, B2 rated researcher, and has a strong interest in two research fields. Firstly, the effects of chronic stress on cardiometabolic diseases onset, and secondly, the development of HIV-related cardiovascular diseases. He is the former president of the Physiology Society of Southern Africa, the current president of the African Association of Physiological Sciences, a former board member of the General Assembly and current council member of the International Union of Physiological Sciences, as well as chairperson of the South African National Committee of the IUPS. So that's the International Union of Physiological Sciences. He also served as a member of the International Committee of the American Physiological Society and is an elected fellow of the American Physiological Society. He has been appointed as associate editor and section editor for Frontiers in Cardiovascular Medicine and PLOS 1, respectively. During 2021, he was awarded the PSSA's prestigious Lifetime Career Achievement Award that honors a well-established physio physiologist who has proven their research excellence over a period of time. During 2018, Prof. F. Esop received a University Teaching Excellence Award, well done, and also became a Teaching Advancement at University, a TAL Fellow in 2022. So as you saw from the invite, uh, Prof. Esop will be talking to us about introducing broader humanities and arts concepts into the biomedical science curriculum. So over to you, um, Prof. Esop. We would love to hear from you. And colleagues, while Prof. Esop is talking, if you've got any burning questions, issues, um, we chatted about it beforehand. You're welcome to also post some of your questions in the chat. I'll be watching the chat. Uh, Prof. Esop will talk for about um, 25 minutes until about 1.30. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for discussion and questions. And I'll also look at the chat throughout and then pick up on some of those themes emerging and we can have a discussion about that. So you don't have to wait until the end, but if you've got questions coming in as he's speaking, please post in the chat as well. Prof Esop, do you want to share your screen? Over to you. Thanks so much, Antoinette. Fine introduction. Good afternoon to all. I hope you can hear me. So let me just see. I'm on all those committees, but this is a tough thing to <laughs> upload the screen share. And I'm just waiting for the presentation. I will let you know when I see it on my <laughs> side. There we go. I see something happening. That's a good sign. Brilliant. I see your first slide. Thanks, Fadil. Are we good to go? We are good to go. So I've got my watch next to me. To I didn't time the talk, but let's see how it goes. So also thanks um, to the organizers of this seminar series for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share. As mentioned, I've joined the TAO program and just completed my fellowship. And as part of that process, I had to work on a specific project which in my case was to look at curriculum renewal, uh, specifically at the postgraduate level for the BSc Honours um, cohort in Biomedical Sciences. And I guess I could call it an attempt to introduce <laughs> broader humanities and arts. So let's share and then we can see um, from the questions how we go along. So why the need for such a module? I've got a couple of reasons. Um, so the first one is once upon a time, 
So that was some time ago now, I think 2019, just before COVID. Um, I uh, started a visual redress project. I was at the main campus still in the Mike de Vries building with Elmeri Costandias. And so we worked for several months with a range of people, students, professors, different colors, all kinds of diversity. And through interacting and art and paint and discussions, to cut a long story short, we came up with this image as you see on the screen with some phrases there. And so it th that was now to be installed the next step. And so I- Fadil, sorry, yes. Fadil, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We cannot see your next slide. Oh, you Could don't you just see? advance it, please? I did actually. Um, and now? I advanced it, yes. It seems like it's working. And if I advance again, do you see the next? I cannot see the next. Oh, so slide. maybe Antoinette should advance it, perhaps. There we go. I'm advanced. Wait, I now advanced up to two, and there's three. So yeah. So maybe you should just um, give me a heads up, and I'll advance from my side. So at the moment, where are we on, on the viewer side? We've got two pictures. Yeah. So we've got chapter yeah. six on yeah. the left hand okay. side and then okay. the integration on the right hand side. Fantastic. Thanks. And I'll give you the cues for the next one. Brilliant. So, so I'm still on slide one. It's yes. slide one, yes, but there's two images. No. Oh, no. no we yeah, just the introduction to broader humanities and art. It's just the first slide that's oh, visible. We're we still are just seeing the title slide, um, Fadil. I'm sorry. But. Um, and to Annette can see the ones. I wonder. Sorry, it, it, it seems we have there's a, a button on top bottom left of the screen, and um, so individuals can scroll through the slides by looks of things. So All should right. I keep the queue and the individuals? Each one will then click on when I say so. Would, would that be the best? There's some comments. I don't know if you can check. Um, I'm quickly going to just check the chat and my chat disappeared. Corin, can you please just check the chat yes. because my chat has disappeared. Yes, everybody is commenting that they can still see the slide one, but that you can advance it uh, on the individual side. But uh, Jean Ontong said it may be easy to share your desktop as you are currently sharing the PowerPoint directly. How would I do that? Um, there's an arrow. There's an arrow just to the right of your mic, um, which says share. Yeah, and yeah, if you then yeah. click on the share, and instead you just share your screen, and then you can share your presentation from your screen if it's oh, active on your screen. Okay. okay. Let's just see. And can people see the second slide now? Yes. 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 Thank you. Everybody. Wonderful. Excellent. Sorry for that. Yes. Okay. No problem. Just Thank lost you. Lost a bit of time there, but in any case, so that was the image you heard, the, the sort of um, the tail I spun to you, and so that was the image, and uh, we wanted to install it, but somebody within the Faculty of Science, a senior administrator, blocked the process, so it wasn't scientific enough, was the allegation, and that put me onto a chapter I had to write, requested by Almeri and also Aslam Fattar about this whole process and some of my reflections and two key points I want to highlight today that brought me onto this journey. One was the issue of rising managerialism at universities and the impact on collegiality and academic freedom, as we've seen. And secondly, importantly for us now, is this scientific elitism concept, that this wasn't scientific enough. So it put me onto a whole tangent to go and search. There. And so bringing me to the point that Often scientists view our discipline as neutral and devoid of any context, sociopolitical, historical context, and um, so and the emphasis in our training of students on the biological and far less or none on humane aspects, so to speak, and a sort of alienation from other disciplines, and perhaps a self-inflated belief of our methodologies of our disciplines and a bit of arrogance at times. So, so that was one good reason, I think. The second 2020 
COVID pandemic hit, so about the same time I had that episode. And so um, post-truth has been along uh, uh, for a while now. 2016 the, was the year, word of the year, Oxford Dictionary. But pronounced now with the COVID as you, pandemic, as you know. And so obviously then the emphasis less on facts and more on shaping public opinion by emotion and personal beliefs. And so we've got examples, Donald Trump claiming to win the election. And this kind of thinking together with social media's pervasiveness, and we've all been victims of this, has seen the rapid dissemination of fake news, of disinformation, misinformation, and so forth. So I was just wondering, I wonder how our science graduates would cope in this world if they challenged by somebody who's well read, but who is, say, uh, denies uh, the, the vaccine kind of thing. So that was another reason. And then thirdly, we, we saw universities even earlier being questioned our roles, but um, now further sort of under the spotlight with the pandemic, and especially the scientists, again, devoid of context and now thrust into the spotlight with the pandemic and competing with others, other so-called experts, other voices, influences, and often losing this sort of um, getting people onto our side. So all of those together, I thought at the time that there's a gap in the training of research students and scientists to operate within this changing world. And I thought it's best to start this dealing with this at the honors level because relatively small classes, I could test my ideas and, and, and then see from there if one can spread this wider and filter it into the undergraduate levels. And so this was really the basis then for the Tau project, by the way, which I got onto via Karen, just by an innocent <laughs> inquiry <laughs> about it. And there I was part of the program. So thanks to Karen for that. And so when designing the new module, I considered a few things. So the first one was just to look again at Stellenbosch's strategic sort of intent in teaching and learning and th thinking of a transformative student experience and to prepare our citizens for a complex world. So it fitted nicely with what I had in mind. And also graduate attributes, which I've been interested in before also, and that always worried me that we don't actually often realize it, at least in the scientists. Sciences, critical thinking, um, an engaging curriculum, which I was now busy with, hopefully, and also to deliver that in a dynamic way, such that we produce more thinkers and not only technicians, even at master's and PhD levels, I think the shift has been a bit more towards the technical side and less of the philosophical side. So um, very reductionist type of thinking. So that was a key aspect that I brought into the design. And then in terms of theoretical lenses, um, with my town advisor, Professor Viz Vivian Bozalak, we looked at various theories. And so reflection in learning was a key one that we brought into this project. And obviously in the sciences, there's not a lot done in this regard. So I had to think out to provide the rationale for this process when I'm going to do it with the students, to fully brief them in, in terms of different contexts, um, produce introduce assignments to cultivate this, to model this as the instructor, and um, to hopefully instill this as something that they could practice throughout their lives as students and as professionals. And then also authentic learning, real world problems, which I always liked anyway before. And then with that open ended thinking to bring that in engagement in class, far more than just lecturing, which often is not the case in the science world because we're so driven by content and then to involve the students in terms of looking at the content assignments and so on, and then the assessment of the tasks to be authentic and also to bring in some collaborative um, work. And then I wanted to also for them to consider the complexity of the science process, sort of the good side, the bad and the ugly, the full thing through the entire cycle. 
so that they can gain increased insights and a critical and deeper understanding reg regarding the scientific process. And so that was part of the uh, curriculum and part of the way we sort of carried over the message. But also to, to temper this because there's limited time and, and it's impossible, obviously, to for them to become competent historians or philosophers of science in this sort of short time. And then I also like Martha Nussbaum's ideas, this the complexity in human learning and her whole idea of cultivating this cultivation of humanity and also resonating with the university's idea that we should promote skills, values and ideas to enhance our humanity, but to bring that into the science world. So that, that was the challenge. And I, th I, I thought, OK, I will tie that. And um, things such as empathy and holistic views. And so. She highlights three at the bottom, it's underlined sort of aspects, the capacities, the critical examination of the self and your traditions. So to to live a, an examined life, so to speak, a meaningful life. Um, and students recognizing themselves bound to others in essence, really. So, so that was also brought into the picture. And then through the advisor, Vivian, we focus on a design based approach to for the research project, which I had to learn from her, basically very interesting and the different phases. So in a nutshell, to look at the problem in an organic way, to consider the theory, to look at practice and all of that and identify the problem and then to develop solutions for this problem. So if that's the knowledge gap, how am I going to address it um, through my innovation and to do this via so-called design principles that would guide the direction of the innovation. And then the third phase is to implement this and evaluate it. From student feedback, peer feedback, and as I'm doing with, with this audience, and then go to phase four to reflect on the feedback, to refine my design principles and to roll it out again, several iterative cycles till I get to the desired outcome. So these were the draft principles, design principles we, we agreed on. Number one, choose meaningful real world problems for teaching and learning. Two, employ engaging discourse in the class with open ended discussion and sharing. Promote a holistic understanding number three of the scientific process and a bit of history and philosophy. Four, promote self reflection by the students. To enhance their synthesis and validation of knowledge and to increase their empathetic capacities, the Nussbaum ideas and also social justice, which is a big thing with the Tau program. So to bring that in as well. And then to employ open ended number five and self reflective tasks together with authentic assessments. So this was the module that I launched then earlier this year. Um, I got eight lecture slots, 90 minutes a couple of weeks to do it. And they wrote a little test. I call it the features of science, FOS, at the start of the module and then also at the end, the same test. And we covered the content, as you can see. We can't go through it individually, but interesting topics, conspiracies, race in science, decolonization, etc. And we got ethical approval for um, surveys that I did with the students at the end, anonymous, and also an analysis of the reflective journals in anonymous fashion. And I could pull out themes from that. And I'll share some of that. Um, in terms of the assessments, they had to do a reflective journal, a short essay on the post-truth world and their views, and then group presentations on some of, on those topics that I've listed there. Um, you can see it's a bit out of their comfort zone neoliberalism, the post-truth world, and so forth. And like I mentioned, they wrote a pre-module test right at the start, no prep. They went in cold and we repeated the same post-module, the same test after the module, no prep as well, and, and no marks involved. OK, so I'll go through each of those principles I've listed and give you a bit of feedback on them. So what we did, one, choose meaningful real-world problems. 
So I, I did with them eugenics. So that's a bus in Nazi Germany to uh, people to go to the concentration camps. But then the roots of this, you see, to look at that in terms of some of the scientists of, of before, Darwin's descent of man, where he has got gradations between people. And of course, the lowest would be black-skinned indigenous peoples. Galton's ideas of human improvement through genetics and racial hierarchy being introduced with white skinned people superior, and then some cases. The Immorality Act in this country, again, it's rooted in that. Or the Tuskegee syphilis study in the United States, 1930s. 400 black syphilis individuals enrolled, males, and they left them untreated to see what would happen. That's it. 100 people died like that. And this lasted for 40 years almost, despite treatment becoming available in the 1940s. And then that it wasn't only a recent recent phenomenon still. You see, this was in two, five years ago, a publication. Black skinned people have thicker skins versus white. And medical students, most of them believe that still. So these things are deeply rooted. And this was one of my students' comments on this, that they were shocked, obviously, to, to, to see that this kind of thing <laughs> was still existing. And then we also discussed, I'm sure you've all seen this article, there to read this and come in for a discussion uh, um, in the class. And so this is some of the feedback from the journals that we got. Um, so they like the real world implications. I've got an highlighted in blue, energized and excited. Anxiety, I found myself very anxious as we never discussed race before, you see. Sensitive topic for a lot of people. People were scared how it's going to turn out. Some students were angry. But interestingly, this comment in blue, student three, for me, this speaks of a failure in the whole peer review system because the paper on the so-called colored women went through ethics, went through peer review, was funded by the NRF. And the last student felt proud to be part of a group of individuals to have open discussions and felt this is a key way to go forward. Number two, to have open-ended discussions in class. And so I used a framework there to create the space for this, to so provide some guidance, such as inclusivity, care and cooperation and so forth. And to try, I set out to move from a safe space to a more brave space, um, where people are obviously more vulnerable and exposed, um, a pedagogy of discomfort by my, my, my supervisor, Bozilek, Brenda Leibovitz as well. So where students have to try and undergo learning and unlearning processes. So, so that was obviously a bit anxious for myself too, to see how it would pan out. Um, interestingly, this is just the nature of the classes now. Discuss of all of them, no lectures formally. Read a paper, come and discuss. Or get a topic, come and discuss. Open-ended. They've never experienced this, which is interesting for me that science students wouldn't have done this before. And very stressed and uncomfortable, very shocked to ask for my input. <laughs> OK. Um, but they felt later on, you can see my opinions were respected and it aided in the learning experience. The last comment, a wave of relief has washed over me that we're all actually learning in the discussions, encourage flow of thought and so forth. I find this rather exhilarating, which was please, pleasing to see. Um, but interestingly then that initially the reluctance to speak. I don't know if it was due to COVID that they've become a bit more toned down, or is it something unique that we find in the science and biomedical science environment? People are more just open to listening and in not actually sharing their viewpoints. So it was bizarre for them to be asked, what, what do you think? So that's an interesting point to think about and discuss. And then number three, <clears throat> time is really Catching me, I see. I've got about Antoinette, 10 minutes? Or? Yes, please. Yeah. 10 minutes, perfect. 10 minutes, and I'm up to slide. Which one am I now? I can't see. Any case, so I went into the scientific 
the social contract that science has got with society and that we need legitimacy. So society gives us financial resources and we have to obviously act in a particular way, ethical standards, rigorous, credible research. So this was the basis that we discussed as well. We looked at the entire scientific cycle. This is just my own diagram from hypotheses, generation, Popper's ideas of disproving the hypothesis to publications, science communication, the full old Monty, so to speak, and critically looking at all those steps. Things such as new liberalism and its impact on academia, on science, they, they were exposed to this, you see. And some of the th papers we looked at, new liberalism and education, the impact on the education system, that we've got to churn out more. I hope I still have a job after this. <laughs> more graduates in a specified time, more publications, the demands increasing. Um, so is that necessarily a good thing? And the culture to publish or perish. So we looked at this concept of fast science. We've got to produce and there's no time to really think, you see. And I gave a nice analogy here. So you see here, we've got perhaps in the Middle Ages, let's say, somebody thinking of a theory, completing experiments and reflecting and building on that theory. So building, constructing edifices. However, with the move now to so-called fast science, we focus on data collection on the production and neglecting theory building. So you can think of bricks. Look on the left. Every day there's a barrage of bricks down our email boxes of new papers. And there's no time to really think. So we become brick makers and not really boulders, you see. We've lost that. So we can't make, as you see on the right hand side, a distinction between a pile of bricks and a true edifice. So I gave them that um, sort of analogy as well. And then from this stems many problems in science today. Research integrity, we see more and more cases. This is just some of the papers we looked at. Misconduct, where is this all coming from? It can be linked also to the system we're operating in. Reproducibility, the rush to get things done. We're compromising on quality. You see. There's fake papers being produced, predatory journals. So these were all discussed in class. You see. So they became quite savvy. And then translation of basic science, I'll have to rush through this a bit, into the clinic, and many of these things don't work at the essence, okay? And then we had a session on science communication because the public don't really understand science with respect. Um, they must understand concepts such as the scientific experiment, the nature of a scientific study. And so I had somebody come and talk to us, Wilma Stassen, about um, scientific communication. And so this is just some of the feedback from the students. Nothing is black and white. They're thinking critically. Contradictory information, confirmation bias. A commitment to transparency. A lot of them began to think more about ethics and honesty and integrity, which is just the values I wanted to get across to them. And then in terms of self-reflection, the journals, um, they had a lot of difficulty with this because they've never done this before. And they were thinking more, not emotionally, so to speak, but more in terms of trying to make it a checklist and, you know, just becoming a bit diffuse. So I had to guide them a lot on this. It's not an intellectual exercise. And so I think there's some work to be done there. But um, I think they enjoyed this, created a sense of thoughtlessness, empathy towards humanity, and so on and so forth. So and then I had a project, I want to share this at least before the end. I started with the arts department with uh, Elizabeth Gunter and Elmer Costanias. I went out to speak to the art students, second years, gave them a talk about heart research, my field, and some of the diseases and so on. Left them for a few weeks, they generated art, and then we had an exhibit. And then I brought the honors class to come and look at the exhibit, and they had to engage with art students, almost one on one, and then capture their thoughts afterwards. So discussions around 
these art pieces, and then we captured what these are some of the beautiful artworks you can see on the left and on the right in the yellow, some of the science students comments. So we're now mixing the two, you see, although science often focus on the detail, it, we have to consider the whole and the bigger context and humane aspects. And this kind of thing you can bring into your diagnostic research, therapeutic strategies. They focus on different aspects, science and arts. They overlap, the student noted, and there's interconnectivity. And maybe we should take a step back from the detail to allow for more creative thinking that can lead to innovation and unique discoveries. That's just another painting at the end, as you can see. There. Um, and this is just some feedback because time is of the essence of the questions and the assignments, and they've come far. Just focus on the blue critical skills developed. They love the group presentations, the last two comments. So they did the group presentations to the whole department. So they were quite anxious and nervous, but that went very well. And they learned a lot. You can see at the last two comments, bounced up ideas of each other, amazing experience. And it taught me far more than the traditional exams and tests and so on. This is just feedback from the survey, very positive, all nines and eights. The only one is question nine, discomfort. That was the one on the race that we discussed. That they felt um, because the anxiousness, the anxiety, what's going to happen and how, what will I say? Will I offend people and so on? These are the scores, the test scores before and after that they did cold. You see a significant improvement. I love that statistical value there. And then I've got my second last slide, the impact. Social justice, because Tao is focused on that and that uh, scholarship of teaching and learning and social justice interrelated, and that we go for this pedagogy of, for social justice, for transformation of students and knowledge. So we made students aware of those concepts listed. Lecturers I began to chat to in my department about the course content. And so as a result, we had a departmental seminar on science and racism with about 80 people attending. And for myself, it's been useful because I'm writing now, I'm interested in this topic, science and racism. So write some articles on that. And in terms of change agents, so a new module has been established, I think successfully, very positive feedback. I will look at the design principles and modify it for 2023. And then to expand the program, because the building I'm working in, they've heard of this, I shared with the department, the BMRI, and so Prof. Baltzell wants me now to take it from medical physiology to include two more uh, specialities, genetics, human biology, and anatomy. So I don't know how am I going to do that next year. So I need to train an interested cohort of lecturers, which I've identified. I want to build on interactions with visual arts. I also went to journalism, but you can ask me about that. And then also with Marina Joubert at Crest. She will involve, be involved next year. And then lastly, with the International Union of Physiological Sciences, they've asked me to be a book editor, a prestigious volume on this topic. So I'm basically take my curriculum and make each one a chapter and get experts to write about that, and this could become a nice textbook in the future, actually. Last slide, that's just the arts and the sciences sort of meeting, soft hands for the arts humanities, the hard edge for the science. But I've also reflected as I've gone along, and I think we need more to think more about this, because we can't just think of the humanities and the arts to service us as scientists and that they provide so-called soft skills, empathy, ethics, values. I think that would be naive to think like that. So I think that I will also have to look at a bit more and to think rather what they're producing on their own. And they're not only there and existing to make us as scientists <laughs> seem more human. Thanks a lot for your time. I hope I've created some interest and some questions, and I hope I'm on time. Thanks to the chair. Brilliant. Many thanks for that, Fadil, and you are 
um, spot on time and I see a lot of clapping coming um, from the colleagues on the call as well. And thanks so much for sharing. I think you went from the more specific, your modules specifically. And then I think as um, questions came out in the chat as well, specifically from um, Dr. Farmer from the Center for Teaching and Learning in terms of sharing this wider, uh, just be, she, she posted that and then you came to the social justice and the change agency part slide. So thanks for also including that. And then of course, Karen also emphasizes, just as a footnote, change agencies emphasize in the TAL fellowships. So I think this afternoon, and then as you also indicated, broader discussions within the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, hopefully will also kind of um, go out to more faculties and sharing within the university the incredibly important work that and the research that you've done. Just don't want to miss any of the questions. I think there was one other question from, from Jean Lee, and that is, did any of the students raise the issue of pain of racism or not belonging? How was this addressed? Any comments from Thanks your side that about question, that? Yes. So um, I think the racism issue, that class, I also was anxious how to approach this um, and even which guidelines to put down. So I simply took the Constitution of South Africa <laughs> as a guide. I literally copied and pasted that to, to use it as a basis. Um, and the, the attempt to move from a safe to a brave space, which came from the Tao sessions we, we attended, and they made me aware of this concept of the brave space and pedagogy of discomfort where we have to not necessarily be in a safe space and sort of dismiss contrarian views, but to go that way. I don't think we completely succeeded in that um, because the students were extremely cautious. They were quite um, wary of what they were saying, and I needed a lot of coaxing and reassurance that they can express themselves in a meaningful way. And so I think there's some work to be done um, because they were a bit reluctant to really open up. I had another problem at the same time that I think hampered us, even though it was post COVID, so to speak, um, we couldn't get a venue, the organizer for the honors. So hence this was done online, which I was quite furious about because this is essential to do face to face the entire program. So that made it even harder, I think, such a contentious topic because we're staring at the black screens as we're doing now and trying to deal with this without actually seeing people in three dimensions. So I think when we roll it out next year, it should be better in that sense because it will be face to face, hopefully. And then I need to find ways to better get the students to share even more, I think, because I think they will too scared and too conservative, although they did comment more, more shock and horror of what transpired, yeah. but not a lot of sort of personal experiences being shared. I hope that answers the question. I see, Jean Lee, your hand is up, and then also, Debbie, I see your question as well, but please go ahead, Jean Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoinette, and thank you very much, Fadil. This is really, really brave and necessary work and you did um, answer my question satisfactorily. Um, I am also just cautious because of my own work with black academics um, at historically white institutions, um, the issue of, of the pain and how exposed they felt once they realized that they don't actually belong after going through a session with me. So I would like to discuss with you um, around that issue of caution. And if he is, you are any psychologists or um, anyone like that in the meeting, it is, um, I think, important to, um, to tread carefully, especially where, um, where people, where it comes to the fore, that people have pain that they may not previously have realized. So how to pose those questions? So it's not a question to you, really. It's just um, maybe something to consider. And if you have any ideas to please share with me in future on how to address those issues of pain. But 
brilliant work. And then also just another comment in that um, the social sciences don't always have all of the soft skills because I don't think that we um, often address the important issues either. I feel that there's a lot of um, avoidance around issues that we consider to be painful, issues of the past that's faltered into the present. But thank you for this work. Very, very important work. Thanks so Thanks. much. Uh, I will actually be in touch with you then. Um, I'm also just finding my way. Um, That'll be great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. I think as well, then maybe Debbie's question, the last comment about service modules, and I think that comes back to your last slide, the taking hands and the co-creation and, and not being seen as a service module, arts modules. So I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, Fadil. Just having a look. So it's about co-creation workshops for content. Have you looked at that? So not just to see it as a as something, you know, kind of more yeah. looking at multidisciplinary collaboration. I have not. So I think that's a good point that has sort of come from the initial part of this work. Um, so and I've always had the broader vision that it's not going to be limited to science and now in medicine, but to bring in also engineering and others. So I would be open to that kind of thing. Yeah, it's just how to do all these things <laughs> with the limited time we've got. But I, I like your idea, thanks. Yes, I think um, in terms of the further dissemination and the further sharing, um, I saw, I don't know if Prof. Juganath is still on the call, but I think in terms of academic renewal, we have a renewed um, kind of emphasis on graduate attributes as well that you also reference in your slide, Fadio. So I think it's looking holistically at all of these issues and seeing how we can disseminate this, you know, not just make it in one, one, one faculty, but actually broader in more faculties. I can comment on that, yes. So I think with this new book volume we're going to be busy working on, um, those topics will all be fleshed out beautifully. And I think that could become a nice resource that we could use across faculties. And I think beyond, it's not a Stellenbosch problem. So I think this is a global problem because my colleagues in the States will be working on this issue and it's the same kind of thing. Um, so I think the sky is the limit for us. And it's a nice position for Stellenbosch to be in, I think, to make this kind of contribution on, on, a, on a broader front. Absolutely, absolutely. I see, Philip, I see your hand. Um, I'm going to give you a chance just now, but just to alert you in the chat, Lucinda has also um, posted the link to provide some feedback. And Almarie had to leave, but we have a recording that will be made available afterwards to all the participants as well. So um, over to you, Philip. Thank you. For this is incredibly exciting and inspiring. Uh, just a quick comment on the the race issue, the sensitivity. Um, I've experienced the caucusing approach in race and gender, so uh, almost ironically, in a, in a way, separating uh, students of color and white students initially, uh, similarly separating men and women initially for the initial discussion. Um, pros and cons, but uh, my experience is that that can open up more discussion to begin with before coming back together. Um, and then I just wanted to ask, uh, just to remind us that this was an honors course that you were doing. Uh, how many students there were again, and what, where do you feel like it could be translated into a course for sort of math undergraduate participation, and what the obstacles might be with that? Thanks. All right, did you get that, Fadil? Because I lost it. My I idiogram today is not. I think he was idea. asking about the number of, of students in your module and potentially. Um, also um, taking that to undergraduate students and what you would perceive would be the barriers um, in terms of doing that or challenges in terms of, of extending it to undergraduate as well. Thanks for that. So um, we only had 16 students, you see, so that was quite easy. And for next year, the, that will shoot up to 50 because of the other departments coming in into the BMRI, this Biomedical Research Institute. Um, I've been thinking a bit about the undergrad um, issue. 
unless we have a formal module, which could be quite a story, I think we'll have to look in our context. So if I'm teaching physiotherapists or medical students, how I can bring these concepts by using examples, so to speak, but that would fit the module also. So that would be the challenge. So that it's not seen as an attachment that doesn't make sense, you see, if you know what I'm saying. So I think there's, there's room for that, but it needs some thought. And then just the other thing in terms of the race, I started that whole discussion on the race issue by just asking the students a question at the beginning, how many races do you think we've got in South Africa? So there was initial sort of silence and then they began to say one, two, four, ten or whatever. And then I began to first look at it from a biological perspective. Sort of. And, and that it's a social political construct. So sort of dismantle that and then we began to talk about it. But I don't know if that that would also help. Right. Thank you so much for that. I see your question, Mr. Burgess. I think um, as Fadil just mentioned, it's 16 students and then in you know going up to 50 next year potentially. Um, so it is quite a low student lecture ratio that he had this year. Um, Cecilia, I see your hand. Maybe a last question, and then I unfortunately have to run. So I would love to then thank uh, Fadil as well for his um, presentation. Please go ahead, Cecilia. Okay, thanks, Antoinette. Um, from lovely work, Fadil. Huge respect for what you're doing, and we certainly need to connect. We find ourselves in the same faculty, and we're doing sort of similar work. Um, on our side in the Center for Health Professions Education. But just a quick question. I understand the importance of a module of this nature because it puts issues um, on a curriculum. It sort of highlights issues in a curriculum and it puts issues on the agenda. Um, but it also creates the possibility that things then get done in that module and everyone says, well, that's where it's done. And so we tick that box. We don't need to, to take it up as a broader collective of science lecturers. Is that, did you find any of that? Um, or was it still worth putting it into a module and having a strong curriculum presence? That's a great question. Thanks, Cecilia, and for the comments. Yeah, so that is a fear that even in the Tao we discussed, because what would be the long term impact? I think that's your question. And then ideally, you would like to follow these guys in the longitudinal fashion almost um, and see what happened. Do they become? change agents eventually in society. So I don't know how feasible that would be, but that would be the ideal. I think that is a valid concern. Um, we worked at the honours level, so we would like to take this further, at least in our division, and expose the other students at master's and PhD level also to some of these ideas, perhaps not as formal as we've done. Um, and then hopefully one can further strengthen those ideas. Yeah, but I cannot answer your question. Obviously, there was great enthusiasm at the time of the module. Students loved it. It was the best thing they've done in years, they said. But the long term impact, yeah. I'd have to follow them, I think. That's the only way that we've come to conclude uh, and sort of get some or uh, perhaps interview them again. Don't know what you guys think after year two and, and, and survey and again see sort of what their thinking would be. I'd, I'd welcome some input actually on that. Perhaps Cecilia and I can discuss that also. Sure, thanks for Fadil, I look forward to that conversation. Okay. Excellent colleagues, so Fadil, I think you see lots of uh, words of appreciation coming in via the chat from Susan von Skalkwake as well. Um, Dr. Armory, Taryn, Bernard, um, everybody, and Nicolene as well, saying thank you and well done. So that makes my job very easy at the conclusion of the seminar, um, just to, from my side as well, I think on behalf of everybody that attended, um, to extend a huge word of thanks um, for the amazing work that you're doing. Incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and I think in terms of the Tau Fellowship, uh, both in terms of wider dissemination and the book that you are planning um, that you also mentioned in terms of becoming incredibly valuable institutional resource as we um, move forward and also want to extend these types of initiatives into many modules and programs at our university. 
um, I think could become incredibly, incredibly helpful. So thank you so much, not just for today's presentation, uh, but also for, I think, the continued impact that your work will have. And as Cecilia mentioned, and everybody, let's keep these conversations going. Um, thank you very much and have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Antoinette. Keep well. Bye. Bye-bye, colleagues. And thank you so much for attending and see everybody at the next seminar, the fourth one. Bye-bye.